You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I hope wherever you are in the world and whatever you're doing, you're doing pretty bloody well. The guest on this episode of the show is a bloke called Trey Daniels, and he is the excellent bass player in US. Would you call them new metal? Maybe. They're a metal band either way. P.O.D. a.k.a. Pable on Death. They are touring Australia through April. Let me read out some dates. They are playing the 17th of April at 170 Russell in Melbourne. The 18th, that's my birthday, at the Gov in Adelaide. Then they're playing the 20th of April at the Factory Theatre in Sydney. The 21st of April at Eaton's Hill Hotel in Brisbane. I should be able to go to that one. Or even the next date, which is at the Gold Coast at the Coolangatta Hotel. The 22nd of April is the date of that performance. Let's hear what Trey has to say. I'm going to issue a bit of a warning here. You're basically going to be listening to two bass players talking shop. Here we go. Yeah, oh, well, mate, let's plug away and let's see how we go. Have you got many interviews? Obviously, you've got heaps of interviews on after me, haven't you? Uh, I think i got something going on, yeah. Yep. yeah. We're trying to figure it out right now, but, uh, yeah, so what's going on with you guys, man? Well, we're looking forward to you coming down to Australia, I can tell you that. I know when uh, John put out the request for if we wanted to interview members of the band, I know he was inundated with requests, so that must be pretty heartening to hear that you've got a lot of fans and media interest down here in Australia. Um, I wouldn't say it's hard to hear. <laughs> oh, heartening. Sorry, it's actually I said, cool to hear, but... Uh, oh, sorry, I meant to say heartening to hear. Okay. You know you guys' language. I love it, man. It's like I always have to lift a little bit harder uh. <laughs> to make sure I catch everything. <laughs> awesome. But, um, yes, it is, man. It is. You know, um, it's been a while since we've been to Australia, I think, man, and I'm looking forward to uh, just getting down there and playing and just uh, spending some time with uh, my Aussie neighbors. Awesome, mate. So can you tell us a little bit about the show that you're bringing down here? Uh, it looks like my understanding is we're doing the uh, satellite um, album from front to back. Mm. Um, <clears throat> it's been a long time since we've done anything like that. We normally play probably about five or six songs from the satellite record, but to be able to play like a couple of few, uh, about three or four other songs on that record that we haven't played like ever mm. live. So um, we actually did a, a residency in uh, Houston, Texas, here in the United States. And we're able to run through some of those songs and play them, and actually great songs and uh, great crowd response. So we're looking forward to playing it mm. when we get down there. So have you got a lot of feedback from Australian fans over the years, particularly about the Satellite album? Um, I think we have. I mean, we have a, um, a plaque that says that we've sold a pretty decent amount of records in Australia. Um, I wanted to say that Satellite, the Satellite record itself, um, what does it say, uh... I think we went um, with a certified platinum or some certified gold. Yeah, gold sells in Australia. So nice. that album went gold down there. So that's a lot. That's pretty good. I think that's twenty or 30,000 albums to achieve that, and which in this day and age is a bloody lot of albums. Yeah, it is. You know. It is, definitely. So you are, you're nine albums into your career with P.O.D. Which album do you think is the definitive P.O.D. album? <clears throat> And when you say definitive, I mean, there's some, an album that I'm, I'm assuming that it represents P.O.D. at its best. Exactly. Pretty much. Yep. Um, I, w- I would say probably the satellite record. I think it was a, it came at a time where we were young and just, you know, I mean, we kind of were very sure about where we were and who we are as a band. And um, that record's just got, like, a lot of really good songs on it, man. I mean, you know, our original lineup was there, so it was me, Sonny, Will, and Marcos, and... Um, I would say that would definitely be the one. So it's exciting to me to be able to get down there um, with you guys and actually play that record. Fantastic. Now, I am a bass player as well, so I'm always thrilled whenever I get an opportunity to talk to a fellow bassist, <laughs> particularly a platinum selling or a gold album selling uh, bass player, mate. So right. which, which of the albums that you've played on do you think has your best bass lines or the bass lines that you're most proud of? Wow. Um, you know what, man? Um <clears throat> Over time, man, I think, um, to me, it'd be the, the earlier records, man. It'd be definitely um, Brown, <clears throat> you know, and uh, probably Fundamental Elements of South Town, and, uh, and definitely Satellite, man. I mean, I think, again, back then, we just were just doing what we did, you know, so it wasn't like, we didn't have a lot of outside influence from record labels or trying to be any particular thing. I mean, we were just being ourselves as a band, and I think um, those would def- both represent my playing. So songs like Hollywood, um, I don't know if you remember that song. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, 
all, all the stuff that was on Fundamental. I mean, it was a lot of great songs on the, both of those records, but I think those best represent my interpretation as a bass player within the POD, um, you know, uh, what is it? Within a POD hierarchy, not hierarchy, but a POD, you know, con- conglomerate of sure. songs. Yeah. You know, I'm a, as a bass, as a bass player, I come from a very funk jazz background. I never dreamed I'd be playing in a hard rock band. I mean, it just wasn't the music I was really interested in. So, mm. Um, when I got with this band, you know, my interpretation, I can't draw from metal bass players or rock bass players. I don't know. I don't know their style. So my um, injection into this band has been basically from a jazz or funk place, you know, especially in the earlier years. I was just doing me how I interpreted it. So, I mean, yeah, definitely those records were definitely a better representation of me as a player. Yeah, you you were one of those bass players because I play four and five string bass as well, and you were one of those bass players on a metal album that you could actually hear your musicality instead of the bass just being used to fill out the low end of the audio frequency. So I'm with you too. I'm not a metal guy either, right? So I do interview a lot of metal bands and the like, but my I've got a big Larry Graham block mounted poster in my music yeah. room. You know, Larry Graham, Stanley yeah. Clark, um, Bernard Edwards yeah. out of Chic. These guys are the guys that really inspire me and I think I can hear a little bit of their playing in your Same here. as well. Thank you very much, man. Same here, man. I mean I grew up listening to bands like I mean um Jaco Pasturias was a huge mm. fan of mine. Um I was into Larry Graham for sure. Um Bootsy Collins, you know, I listened to a lot of that stuff. I listened to a lot of slave, but also you know, surprisingly, I started out playing saxophone with my first instrument. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And one of my favorite musicians has always been, you know, from a horn standpoint, he's been like people like Miles Davis mm. and like um, um, oh. Quincy Jones. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I've always tried to take an approach from bass as a, the approach that a trumpet player would take. You know, and if you look, if you think about it, bass, I mean, I can play the root note to a song, but I think it's more interesting if I danced around a little bit and it's like, it's amazing how different me just hitting the root note could change the whole feeling of a, a chord. Like my guitar player could play a, you know, a chord or play something on guitar. And if I play the minor of that note or major, anything kind of in between that, I can actually change the mood of that note. So bass is a very powerful instrument if it's used correctly. Yes. But I think a lot of people, especially in metal music, man, they just want to play the root and just like, it's boring to me. So as a jazz player, I'm always about that rub, you know what I mean? Where you just know it's just, it just makes that, I don't know, it just to me, that's how they always approach it. So, you know, um, I know you know who Sting is, of course, and um, yep. uh, what is it? Uh, uh, you, not you two, but um, the police had a song called Walking on the Moon. Yeah, of course. Yep. And the bass line on that, on that song to me is the most brilliant bass line with the least amount of notes. You yes. know what I mean? If you think about what he's playing against the music i mean that's what makes that song interesting and a lot of bass players feel like they have to you know play all these notes but i always feel kind of like you know bass is one of the instruments that's not supposed to be a solo instrument i mean i don't want to hear guys playing a bass like a guitar bass has a very important foundation and fundamental place within music and i think some people can just kind of overthink it and my bass player my favorite bass players are the bass players are the most simple bass players but most tasteful Mm. So, yeah, Bootsy definitely fits into that, that category, doesn't it? No, that's great. No, that's excellent because I think yeah. Bootsy definitely falls into that category, doesn't it? It's not flashy playing, but Absolutely. without it, James Brown music doesn't mm-hmm. carry the same weight. No, it doesn't. And the, the things that he's doing is, is brilliant, really, when you think about it. But, I mean, it's all fill and groove. And it's like, I remember being a saxophone player, that was the instrument that I knew how to read and write music on. But mm. when I picked a bass playing, bass guitar, in high school, I was like, hey, man, I need to learn. The guy was teaching me how to play bass. He said, I need to learn, you know, fundamentals and, like, all these notes and this and everything else. And I was also a drummer in high school, too. And he said, no, man. I remember these words vividly. He said, bass is not about all of that theory stuff and all this and everything else. He said, bass is a fill instrument. He said, you can either play a note like this or you can play a note, one note like this. And those two notes that he played were totally different, you know, because just the way he played it. He says a fill instrument. You can learn theory if you want to, but really, it's really a fill type of instrument when you get down to it. So hmm. that made a big influence on me. So that yeah. was where my no, is on that. So very good point there. And I will ask you a question about gear, if that's okay. How, how important do you think gear is in the equation of your playing? Um, I think it can be really important. Um, I think it depends on what sound you're going for. Um, <clears throat> 
for years I was using Eden uh, Eden guitar Eden amps. Yep. And to me, Eden amps to me are the most um, musical bass amps I think I've ever played in my life. I mean, even to this day, you know, um, I still thirst for those Eden cabinets, man. And the Eden the WT eight hundred to me is by far a, a, a um yeah a, a priceless right. head. I use Mesa Boogie stuff now. Um, very pro uh, uh, American <laughs> <laughs> and just you know American built you know so and then bass and boogie for the style of music that we do I mean it just holds an extreme amount of weight I mean when you, when I play it I can get that ampeg sound and a lot of that has to do with playing and there's some other things I'm doing to the cabinet to get that texture mm-hmm. but it's just a big 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 sound and uh, ampeg stuff to me is still, is also amazing I mean in the studio I don't I won't record without an ampeg rig I mean it's probably one of the best recording rigs on the planet so yeah yeah what I are you mean, using the svt I, I series I, yeah the svt classic and the hmm. um svt 810 i mean it's just an unbeatable combination hmm. i mean nothing to me sounds as good as it sounds mic'd up in the studio i mean and i played a lot of stuff and that to me is by far the best you know gallon kruger stuff is really good too yeah that's what um, i play actually i'm a gk the, guy yeah Oh, I love GK, man. I mean, the RB800 was my first head hmm. that I had. Like, when I actually was able to go out and buy a basic head, I bought an RB800. Nice. I, don't know, I know you yeah. remember that. Oh, no, RB, RB400, I think. The, the 400. 400, right? Yeah, there's a, I think there was yeah, an 800. It was a 700, it's 700 or 800, yeah, and then I play the 1001, um, which has just been... Bit, it was a big... Co- no, sorry. No, you're right. You go, mate. It's just... A, it was a big square unit. Um, it's a bigger one, maybe a three space or so. But you say you say you play the updated version of that? Yeah, I play the one thousand and one, and it's just been my gig workhorse for many years. And I use as a backup the MB five hundred, so the micro bass, just in case there's been any problems with the one thousand and one. And I've never had any issues. But you know the saying, mate, never gig without. Oh, they backup. sound amazing. Yeah, they sound amazing, man. They're amazing, amazing, amazing sounding bass heads, man, and their cabinets too. So, you know. Yeah, they can take a beating. There's so no doubt know, about that. Oh, yes. I dropped my AMR. I want to say it's RB800. Maybe it's been so long since I've had it, man. But I dropped that out of the back of the truck, and we had a gig that night, and I plugged it in, and it worked. And you, I don't know, in too many heads, you can do that going down the street. So. Yes. Um, no, you're right. Yeah, it I'm is an RB800. I'm, I'm, I'm just checking on Google yeah. now. It is the RB800, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Gallon Cruiser. I think it's I mean, standing the test of time too. And to me, it's a classic head too. Like as a bass head, I mean, it's, the Antec SVT, the um, RB800 are a classic, classic, classics. Mm. I never got into the Fender stuff too much. It's just not my sound. No, um, likewise. Yeah, I don't I don't like but, it to um, be honest. Yeah. No, I don't like it either. So. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I just googled then. Gallian Kruger. They have an RB seven hundred, which is the new one, and the older one was the RB eight hundred. So God knows why they changed the um, the the model yeah. name. But uh, yeah, there you go. But yeah, no, it's good stuff. And I totally agree with you about what you're saying about the ampegs. Just about every frontline studio you go into for bass playing, anyway, has an ampeg set up in there. Yes, I mean it's nothing. It, it, nothing comes close to the way it sounds. And even live on stage when I play them. It just I get a war. I, I, I want to smile and laugh every time I play it because as a bass player, it just best represents mm. every bass player's playing. I mean, if you're a pick player, or a, I'm a finger guy, so like if I play, you know, my fingers, yeah, I can get that same type of attack out of that bass cabinet, and it just it's very articulate and I don't know, organic feeling it almost. So what are you? Explain. What what sort of basses are you using? I think you're a Michael Tobias design guy, aren't you? No, I'm a Warwick. Warwick. I've been with okay. Warwick for years. Yeah, I've been with Warwick for since. I mean, back in the day when I started with Warwick, I was it was me and Peanut were the only guys. Or me, Peanut, and Norwood Fisher were the only guys oh, who were playing yeah. Warwick in any kind of heavy rock band, kind of so to speak. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I've been with Warwick for a while. For a short time, I went to Stuart Spector, but after a while, I went right back to Warwick. Man, I mean, it's. I mean, there's. To me, it's my favorite bass to play. I like the tone of it. I mean, it's even really solid sound in the studio. The only problem about the works, they're very heavy. Yes, they're top heavy, aren't they? I I had a Corvette FNA and I sold well, it, to be honest with you, because it was so top heavy. Yeah. Which one did you have? The Corvette FNA, a 1999 model. And I ended up trading it oh, in for okay. a Music Man Sterling. Um, and I've never looked back since then, so what? I've been playing the Sterling for about 20 years. 
No, Music Man is great. I have a 1979 Music Man Saber, like an mm, old one, that'll nice. never leave my house. So, I mean, it's a vintage one. But the Warwick that I have that are top heavy are the, um, have you heard of the Thumb Bass? I had a Thumb Bass 5 yeah. string. Yeah, definitely. Yep. They're, they're very top heavy. You have to get the streamer body style. The streamer body style is more balanced. Um, it almost looks like a, um, a, a Spectre. Yes. But I mean, it's uh, got the curved body. But the Stewart, the um, excuse me, the uh, the uh, streamer stage one, the streamer stage two, Warwick's are the most balanced. I haven't played the Corvettes yet, but somebody told me they're a little top heavy too as well. Yeah, look, it had a great sound, mate. But to be honest, I was playing it on stage and I ended up feeling like my back was being pulled in. You know, my, my neck is being pulled in one direction, and my lower back was being pulled in another. Yeah. So I ended up feeling like as they're I, heavy. Yeah, very heavy, yeah. And when I switched yeah. to Music Man, inspired, of course, by Bernard Edwards out of Chic, I um, I even got the yeah. same color as his <laughs> bass, you know. <laughs> I even sought the same color out. Oh, those bases are amazing. Oh, yeah. I, just, I just love that tone, mate. It's just great for everything, slap bass, thumb bass, you know, finger style, everything. jazz walks, everything. the whole thing. Yeah. Yep, it does everything, man. They're great bases. So you have the Ernie Ball version? Yeah, I do. Course. Yeah, yeah. So post nineteen ninety, yeah. yeah, or post nineteen eighty, whatever it was, when they fit Leo sold the company to Ernie Ball. So yeah, but mate, I've I, I've only had one problem: the um the truss rod snapped in my Sterling. So I had to contact Music Man there and send. Oh really? Expo. Mate, they hadn't oh, wow. even heard of it actually happening. So I don't know what happened. I think it was a manufacturing fault. But seven hundred dollars Australian for a must have been my... Yeah, we just played with uh, Rock Prophets of Rage recently, and I sat down and had a long conversation with Timmy C from um, Rage Against the Machine, yes. um, um, Prophets of Rage, and he plays the um, those basses, the uh, Ernie Ball, and he loves them, man. And they're like his tone. I was on stage while he was playing, and he had the best sounding bass tone I think I've heard in like years. Yeah, it's very fat. I just I saw him on the weekend. Did. Yeah, actually, he just played down here in Melbourne. Oh man. No, his bass tone is ridiculous. I mean, he has a really, really, um, I don't know, his bass tone is everything that I, I, I dream my bass tone could be. Just when I thought I had a great bass tone, I hear this guy play bass through his rig, and I'm just like, dude, what the heck are you using? And he had a really weird setup uh, bass. Where he had some weird cabinets that were from Europe that aren't even United States, but he was using Ampeg heads, but his um, cabinets were called something weird I'd never heard of before. But his tone was really, really good. So. Mm. Hey mate, I might That's get up, the, I might get the tap on the shoulder to get off the call so so other people can call through. Honestly, I wish I could talk to you for another couple of hours about all of this stuff. Believe me, you're a very knowledgeable guy and you're an excellent bass player. And I hope we can catch up when you come Thank down. Thank you here. very much. Oh yeah, definitely. And what's your name? Andrew Mackay Smith. Andrew, okay, I'm going to remember you when we get there. Okay, mate. No, I appreciate catching up and having a beer, or if you don't drink a soda water. <laughs> no, no, I have a beer. Definitely, we can't come down to Austin. Down here and not have a beer. Come on, right? For sure, mate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll certainly be in the crowd, so right. I certainly hope we can catch up. No worries. For sure, man. Okay, mate. Thank you very much for the chat. All right. Thank you, Andrew. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and that was my conversation with the wonderful human being, Mr. Trey Daniels, from the band Pod, or P-O-D, a.k.a. Pable on Death. Thank you so much for listening.